U.S. presidential candidates Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton promise voters new jobs and economic growth while accusing each other of offering failed agendas. A new health app takes blood donation in Nigeria to the next level. And how technology is helping U.S. track and field athletes go for Olympic gold. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. This is Africa 54. We begin tonight with a computer systems failure that on Monday shut down one of the world's largest airlines and on Tuesday has forced U.S. Base based Air Delta Airlines to cancel about 100 flights and delay 200 more as it continues recovery from customer relations nightmare. The airline blamed the outage on a loss of power at its hub in Atlanta, saying some of its critical systems failed to switch over to a backup that would have kept them running. Without a functioning computer network, Delta grounded all flights for hours Monday eventually cancelling more than 870 flights across the United States and beyond. Thousands more flights were delayed. Uh, when I got here, I waited, I got here like 837 flight, and then it kept on, you know, delaying and delaying it, and then it never announced that it was cancelled. So I had to call the service and they told me it was cancelled. So they gave me another flight, but then I got a flight tomorrow. So uh, it was the fact they didn't let me know what was going on. Well, it's, it's okay. I mean, in terms of time, because I, I travel like every week, so I have been like worse experience before. It's mainly because of the weather. But if you I, if you consider only like a three-hour delay, it's okay. But it's just a little bit, you know. No one knows what's going to happen. How long we're going to wait? Things like that put a lot of uh, tension on people's mind. Industry experts have begun linking airline computer system failures to corporate mergers that require integrating older computer systems from rival companies into a single expanded system operated by the new corporation. Analysts say such outages in older systems also are becoming more common as carriers continue to automate flight-related services and a host of behind-the-scenes activities involving everything from worker schedules to electronic arrival and departure displays. The two major U.S. presidential candidates are focusing on economy as they continue their campaigning with three months left before the election. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump says he would jumpstart the U.S. economy by suspending new regulations and cutting corporate taxes. Meanwhile, Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton outlined her plan to invest in creating new jobs and making higher education accessible to all. VOA's Latsa Hawk has more. Trump told an audience at the Detroit Economic Club that his America First plan would lift the depressed city and the rest of the country out of stagnation. In a clear effort to appeal to a wider spectrum of voters, he promised to cut taxes for most Americans and to make childcare expenses tax deductible. I am proposing an across the board income tax reduction, especially for middle income Americans. This will lead to millions of new and really good-paying jobs. The rich will pay their fair share, but no one will pay so much that it destroys jobs or undermines our ability as a nation to compete. Trump said Clinton would continue what the Democrats have been doing for some time, which he said was exporting jobs and businesses abroad and raising taxes. We punish companies from making products in America, but let them ship products into the United States tax-free if they move overseas. Clinton's speech in Florida also focused on creating new, well-paid jobs. I want to be the person who helps to create new jobs with rising incomes, and in the first 100 days, I will work with both parties to pass the biggest investment in new jobs since World War II. Clinton said the new jobs would be in manufacturing and infrastructure, but also in clean energy, technology, and innovation. She also promised to make it easier for young people to pay off their student loans and start a small business. If you want to start a business, we're going to put a moratorium on your student loan payments so you can actually borrow the money to get the business started. 
Clinton also accused Trump of lacking fresh ideas. She said his plan would give big tax breaks to large corporations and wealthy people, a strategy she said failed when it was applied by Republicans in the past under the pretext that it would spur economic growth. Trump is working aggressively to catch up with Clinton after a week of controversy that undermined his campaign. Zlarica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Zambians are headed to the polls Thursday to elect their seventh president in the most crucial election since independence in 1964. The election has attracted nine presidential candidates, but the real contest is between incumbent Edgar Lungu and Hakainda Hichilema. All of the candidates have galvanized broad support across the country amid a climate of fear, intimidation and violence. Daniel Tonga reports from Lusaka. Zambians got to the pause on August 11th in an election that could decide the future of Africa's growing democracy. An election heavily contested and highly unpredictable is a real test for Lungu, who is facing a toughest challenge from Hakainde Hichilema of UPND. Having presided over an ailing economy since taking office, Lungu's campaign message has been that of delivering through infrastructure development. We want to show that you are the most sarcastic. Who will vote for you? Some people want to show that they are very sarcastic in their language. But we in PF do not take them all to show them that we can do it better than them. His main rival, Hakainde Hichilema, a successful businessman, improving Zambia's economy, lowering the cost of living and job creation, have dominated his campaign message. Let us work together. You don't get a job when we win. In the streets of Lusaka, campaigns are in full swing and almost every area of the city has been taken up by campaigns. Security is on high alert and military personnel have been deployed across the country alongside election materials. Tough as these elections stand, residents have expressed displeasure over how unfair the electoral process has been since campaigns started to a day of voting. We have seen an election board at the moment that is supporting the ruling party purely and uh, they get instruction from state house. We are not blaming anybody. This is the process of uh, elections. Those who are fighting, they don't know what they are doing. These views are shared by many political players. Among them is Edith Nawakwe, president of Forum for Democracy and Development, FDD. Nawakwe says the electoral process has been full of malpractices, intimidation and violence and shares her concerns. We are going into this election where we, the players, don't even have the rules of the game. And we are participating in this election with heavy hearts, really knowing that it's not transparent, it's not free, and it may not be fair. Zambia's electoral body, the Electoral Commission of Zambia, ECZ, has confirmed how unfair the whole electoral process has been in the run-up to the general election. Chris Akufuna, public relations manager at the Electoral Commission of Zambia, explains. Yes, campaigns have been going on, except that uh, the political parties, um, in some cases, uh, went uh, uh, against uh, the electoral code of conduct. Along voting... To elect a new president, members of parliament and councillors, Zambians are also voting in a referendum seeking to enhance the Bill of Rights and some articles in a newly amended constitution. An election long awaited has drawn wide attention and is closely watched by the international community. At long last, Zambians are waiting to vote in an election much anticipated to be bloody and likely to leave the country bitter divided than never before. Daniel Tonga, VOA News, Lusaka. Now to Ethiopia, where residents and opposition officials say more than 90 people have been recently shot and killed by security forces during protests across the Oromia and Amhara regions. Unrest flared in Oromia for several months this year over plans to allocate farmland surrounding the regional capital for development. Authorities scrapped the scheme in January, but protests flared again over the continued detention of opposition demonstrators. Over the weekend, protesters chanted anti-government slogans and waved dissident flags. 
Some demanded the release of jailed opposition politicians. The state-owned Ethiopian news agency says, quote, illegal protests by anti-peace forces has been brought under control. It did not mention casualties. The United States says it is deeply concerned by the violence in both regions. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, connecting blood donors and recipients with an app. Stay with us. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. Three years ago, U.S. President Barack Obama announced the Power Africa initiative to double access to power in sub-Saharan Africa. More than two-thirds of the population of sub-Saharan Africa is without electricity, and more than 85% of those living in rural areas lack access. The Electrify Africa Act was passed by both chambers of the U.S. Congress after nearly two years. And joining me in the studio is Martin Lowry, Senior Vice President for External Affairs and member relations at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA. Martin, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you so much, Esther. It's you, a you real know, pleasure I'm, to be here. Sure. I, I'm looking at this, which is quite an ambitious program. When you think about 85% of the population in rural sub-Saharan Africa without power, can this really be achieved? 550 million to 600 million people by estimates. Um, I think that's one of the important aspects of why it took two years for the Electrify Africa Act to be completed by the Congress because there were a lot of issues that were discussed around can this possibly be done. Uh, we felt strongly through the whole uh, advocacy process that you had to begin with the principle that access to electricity is a fundamental right of a human being and you've got to figure out a way to do it. I would say collaborative approaches are the only way we'll achieve it. And when you look at Africa, of course, there is no doubt there is enormous potential with all these vast newfound and discovered reserves of oil right, and gas. Right. And, but what really needs to be done to make use of this potential? That's a very tough question and one that, politically speaking, was one that was debated uh, for the two years. Do you look at only a renewable energy strategy or do you have to look at, at fossil resources as well, like oil and gas? Um, the argument that won the day was you've got to look at an all-of-the-above strategy. If you don't do that, you'll be leaving people behind for years and years. The other piece of it, though, is you need pipeline for natural gas, and the whole pipeline infrastructure issue will require some innovative approaches for what we would call off-grid technology. And again, when you look at the Electrify Africa Act, it's been called a life-changing legislation. Mm -hmm. Can you simplify that for us? Well, first of all, I would like to compliment the authors on both sides of the aisle because this was a huge bipartisan success in a period of time when we mostly have gridlock. So we've got Senator Cardin from, from Maryland, Senator Corker from Tennessee. You've got uh, Representative Royce from California and Representative Engel from New York. Those are the heroes of this story, and they fought hard to make sure that the whole principle here of access to electricity and the consequences of that for health, education, girls' education in particular, um, can be seen as absolutely essential to the globe. You know, many people are looking forward to this. I grew up in a country where I didn't have electricity. I had mm -hmm. to use a lantern sometimes to do my homework. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, since the Electrify Africa Act was, you know, passed, 
Have you been on the ground yet? Which countries have you started working on and maybe what are the challenges so far? Yes, and I would say that the work we've been doing recently was inspired by the Electrify Africa Act. We're only at the beginning stage of looking at the collaborative approaches. But for example, we're working in Ethiopia right now with the government on a national electrification strategy. We're doing the same in your home country of Kenya. <laughs> we're working with Uganda specifically on a rural electrification strategy. We're working in Liberia with an off-grid approach to solar energy and then combining that with a question of where you already had diesel uh, available, diesel oil for generation, how would you bring in solar to be able to offset the need to run that diesel 24-7, major projects going on right now. So when you look at uh, some of the countries, sometimes what you run into is uh, bureaucratic tape. Yes. And uh, I'm wondering whether you've run into that yet and how you deal with that. We run into that all the time, and it's not just a situation for the continent of Africa. <laughs> we've, we've been at this business since 1962 on a not-for-profit basis, and everywhere in the world you have to worry about the role of the national government in relationship to people having control of their own destiny. So we constantly work toward the kind of national legislation which ensures that the government does not control the outcome, that it's a public-private partnership, just as it occurred in the United States. Tell me a little about uh, how the electric, electric cooperatives work, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to be able to get electric to people, especially in remote areas of, of the continent. Well, it, it replicates what was done in the United States going back to 1935, which is that the local people, if it's a cooperative, and you can't always do that, so there's a, there's a caveat on that, it, it, it depends on the national enabling legislation. But suppose that enabling legislation allows for a true cooperative. That means the local people, who are basically providing themselves the service of electricity own, own the organization. They maintain the system, they operate the system, and the, the money that you pay on your electric bill is credited to you as a member owner. So there's basically patronage capital. Your patronage of the cooperative uh, builds over time, and most cooperative boards of directors, locally governed boards of directors, will on an annual basis return a certain amount of that retained earnings to the, to the consumer. Martin, I wish we had more time to look at te technology and how this can work with uh, electrifying the rural areas of the continent of Africa. But thank you so much for coming on to Africa 54. Thank you. Martin Lowry is Senior Vice President for External Affairs and Member Relations at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA. Time now for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with the latest on treating asthma. An early study in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine Journal suggests that an experimental pill could help adults with severe asthma. In the small trial, patients who were given the drug, known as Fevipiprine, has less inflammation in their airways and some patients with uncontrolled asthma felt their symptoms improved. Charity Asthma UK says the research showed, quote, massive promise and should be greeted with cautious optimism. Asthma is a long-term condition that affects the airwaves in the lungs and can cause a cough, wheezing, and breathlessness. For most people, the right treatment, such as inhalers, can help control it, but some people have more persistent symptoms. A new health app offers a platform to boost a blood supply in Nigeria. Lagos-based Sarop Life Bank's app focuses on finding, storing and transporting blood, an issue that has been a challenge in Nigeria's healthcare system. It provides a database for blood banks and hospitals across the country, helping them source for the required blood type that patients may need. In just two months after being set up, LifeBank already has 15 hospitals and 30 registered blood banks across Lagos and its environs. Temi Oluwatobusin is the chief executive of LifeBank. LifeBank uh, helps hospitals find the blood they need faster, cheaper and safer. Um, we have a database of all the blood available in a given place in Nigeria at any given time and we can deploy this information that we get through our tech platform to the hands of hospitals so that they know 
when they're in, in an emergency and they need blood for their patient, they come to us and we help them find the blood they need faster. An estimated 1.7 million units of blood in the country is needed yearly to prevent blood-related and timely and avoidable death. However, the National Blood Transfusion Service of Nigeria says it recorded less than 500,000 units in 2014. In Nigeria, most collected blood comes from paid donors as there isn't a culture of voluntary blood. The problem is further compounded by the logistics required to store and move blood to the thousands who need blood daily. Medical scientist Amos Fatokun says LifeBank app has helped save many lives. With the level of innovation, you know, how to do with all this, uh, all this modern day uh, blood banking now, which I believe that it will go a long way in you know, order to help our profession. Although doctors were skeptical about the app when it first launched, some say it has been a tremendous help. We have emergencies. Emergencies before, we are, as a gynecologist, patients come late in the night, 2 a.m., placenta previous, abruptural placentas, they bleed. And it's always a challenge getting blood that late in the night. But we thank God for the services of Life Bank, which is 24 hours. We have experienced it. I call them any time of the day. We are getting services from there. Life Bank plans to expand its operations to two other states in Nigeria, despite some challenges, including funding. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch for more, well, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Back to you, Esther. Be sure to watch Lenore Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday, right here on Africa 54. Still, to, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, how U.S. Olympic athletes are getting a boost from track tech. We'll be right back. up being violent protests. Ascribing salvation to you. Président de la République élu. Green Beat for a healthier planet. Off the coast of Bermuda, a critical mission to explore the ocean floor and research the changes taking place in the Atlantic Ocean. It's called the Necton Mission and claims to be the most comprehensive ocean checkup to date. Here's Mission Director Oliver Steeds. We know that the deep ocean is changing at its fastest rate for millions and millions of years. What we don't really understand at the moment is its health and its resilience. That's why the Necton mission is looking at everything from water chemistry to the effects of invasive species like the lionfish, believed to have spread through human activity. Conservation biologist Alex Rogers believes the biggest problems are due to overfishing. When you seriously overexploit marine ecosystems, it can take them decades to recover. The ocean is critical for humanity, so Mission Director Steed says he'd like to see more money spent on inner space research rather than outer space. I'm Rebecca Ward for VOA's Green Beat. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Scientists in Italy say they will be launching a low-cost humanoid robotic butler in the next 12 to 18 months. And researchers hope this new robot will eventually be the best butler anyone could wish for. It may not look like downtown Abbey's Mr. Carson, but the RI can be just as efficient. The robot was designed with applications to be helpful to people with disabilities. The RI sensors can detect how much force is exerted on the arm, causing it to move away from the contact or can avoid stumbling onto furniture. Next up, U.S. Olympic track and field athletes are getting a high-tech boost. 
The truck man can trace the trajectory of the shot and hammers so that athletes can keep track of how high and far they go. The device gives instant feedback so they can look at the data from their last throw on a laptop screen. For years, U.S. athletes have been calling for organizations such as USA Track and Field to put their profits back into athlete development. And finally, looking to the Olympics of the future, you need a head for heights for this sport. Climbing is the latest sport approved by Olympic leaders to be added to the program of the 2020 Tokyo Games. Other newly added sports include the return of baseball, softball, and the introduction of youth-oriented events such as skateboarding, surfing, and karate. The five which were proposed for inclusion last year by Tokyo organizers were approved unanimously by the IOC members. And that's what's trending today. Months of bloodshed and political instability have made a grim impact on South Sudan's fledgling art scene. But now more South Sudanese are finding creative inspiration in the even the grimmest of times. Charles Lamodong reports from Juba. When one thinks of South Sudan, art is not something that immediately comes to mind. Nyangwa Ben used to work for the South Sudan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but after devoting a number of years to civil service, she felt that she needed a creative outlet and started the House of Ben. In the House of Ben, we, we normally we do African print dresses. And, and now we're working with other artists that actually have beads. We have fewer doing necklace, earrings. So we're combining different artwork from different artists. So it's actually becoming, I, I guess, House of Artists, but it is House of Ben. Deng Chol is a South Sudanese artist who expects more from South Sudan and its art scene. But if only the peace settles and it lasts. Yeah, uh, in the most uh, image displayed about South Sudan is about war and displacement and crisis, all this. But also there is some uh, positive uh, image in South Sudan. I feel like uh, if the, the peace has settled and everyone is uh, a scumbag and settled in everything, a lot, a lot of arts, a lot of amazing things are going to come out from South Sudan. Uh, these people, our people here, are naturally gifted in arts. Yeah, so I'm expecting a lot. Like many things in South Sudan, even art depends on the success of a peaceful and stable South Sudan. Charles Lamadon for VOA, Juba, South Sudan. And that's our show for today. Good night from Washington. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Does this word mean something good has happened? Unleashed. The President is sending Secretary of State John Kerry to the Middle East to help build a coalition to defeat the militants who have unleashed a wave of violence that has included attacks on Iraq's Christians and other minority communities, and recently the videotape killing of American journalist James Foley. Unleashed means to let something very powerful happen quickly. It is like taking a leash off a dog and letting it attack someone. In our story, the militants unleashed or set off a wave of violence. Usually, unleashed does not mean something good. So, the next time you hear the word unleashed, you will know what this news word means.